Hello and welcome to World Panorama, your favorite weekly show on all the big international stories that made headlines this week. Stories that are changing our world, our future. I'm Ashwarya with you. First up, a quick look at the top stories in brief. British MPs debate Boris Johnson's new Brexit deal with the EU in Parliament's first Saturday session in 37 years. PM Johnson says his deal can heal the country. Turkey and US agree on Syria ceasefire to force Kurdish fighters withdrawal. Deal after US Vice President Pence and Turkey's President Erdogan meet for talks in Ankara. United Nations says 1,66,000 people forced to flee over past week. Disastrous start to Hong Kong's new legislative season. Pro-democracy lawmakers disrupt Q&A session. Leader Carrie Lam forced to abandon annual policy address in the chamber. Catalonia witnesses violent protests triggered by Spain's Supreme Court's verdict in which separatist leaders were handed long jail terms. Spain's Prime Minister blames protests on organised violent groups. And mysterious oil spill over Brazil's northeast coast. President Bolsonaro says the spill done intentionally with a criminal intent. Spill sets off concern about marine wildlife. The top story. British MPs are debating Boris Johnson's Brexit deal in Parliament's first Saturday session in 37 years. Earlier, against tough odds, Boris Johnson hammered out a last-minute compromise Brexit deal with his European counterparts on Thursday, raising the prospect that Britain could finally be out of the European Union by the end of the month. The Prime Minister is trying to convince MPs to support the agreement, saying that his deal can heal the country. Here is a report that we filed before the debate in British Parliament began. Just two weeks before Britain was scheduled to leave the European Union, the UK and the EU have come to a new agreement on Brexit. British and EU negotiators had been in intense talks for days as the deadline approached. Prime Minister Boris Johnson called the new deal as a great one that takes back control. European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker too called it a fair and balanced agreement. Discussions over the past days have at times been difficult. But we have delivered, and we have delivered together. So will the deal lead to Brexit on 31st October? Well, that remains in doubt, because the next step in the process is UK lawmakers and EU ratifying the deal. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson insists he is very confident of getting the majority he needs to get Brexit done by his 31st October deadline. This is a, a great deal for our country, for the UK. I also believe it's a, a very good deal for our friends in the EU. And what it means is that we in the UK can come out of the uh, EU uh, as one united kingdom. England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland are together. And it means we can decide our future together. But DUP, Johnson's minority government allies from Northern Ireland and main opposition Labour Party, plans to vote against the deal. The new deal removes the controversial backstop clause and says Northern Ireland will remain in the UK's customs union. But there would also be customs checks on some goods passing through en route to Ireland and the EU single market. The DUP is unhappy with the changes. The deal which uh, the Prime Minister is bringing back from Brussels today, we believe it is not in the interests of Northern Ireland, either economically, that we cannot support this deal. This is a day when the Prime Minister seems to have made a deal with the European Union, which uh, 
doesn't give us the complete freedom of movement between Britain and Northern Ireland because it creates a customs union border down the Irish Sea. And secondly, it uh, does nothing to deal with all the concerns that we've raised during Theresa May's premiership. If UK lawmakers reject the New Deal, Johnson must, by law, ask the EU for an extension, delaying Brexit beyond October 31st. But then it will be up to the leaders of the 27 member states whether to grant one. In case of losing the vote, Johnson might also try again to trigger a general election. If the deal, however, does go through in British Parliament, the leaders of all EU member states and a majority of members of the European Parliament in Brussels must also ratify the deal in order for it to become effective. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Turkey has agreed to suspend its Syria offensive for five days and will end the assault if Kurdish-led forces withdraw from a safe zone along the border. The agreement eased what had escalated into an unprecedented crisis between the United States and Turkey, wherein critics also accused U.S. President Donald Trump of abandoning Kurdish allies. Now, under the deal reached, Kurdish forces will have to withdraw from an area 32 kilometers deep, becoming a safe zone that has been long sought by Turkey, which brands the Kurdish fighters as terrorists. Turkish howitzer positioned in the border town of Salem Pinar, hitting Kurdish militia YPG targets in northern Syria. Ankara launched a military operation in Syria's northeast last week against the YPG, which it sees as terrorists. However, there is hope for some relief as Turkey on Thursday agreed to a ceasefire in northern Syria to let Kurdish-led forces withdraw. The deal came after U.S. Vice President Mike Pence and Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan met for talks in Ankara. The Turkish side will pause Operation Peace Spring in order to allow for the withdrawal of YPG forces from the safe zone for 120 hours. All military operations under Operation Peace Spring will be paused and Operation Peace Spring will be halted entirely on completion of the withdrawal. All fighting will be paused for five days and the U.S. will help facilitate the withdrawal of Kurdish-led troops from what Turkey terms a safe zone on the border. However, it is unclear if the fighters of the Kurdish YPG will fully comply. UK-based war monitor, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said, Clashes were continuing in Rasalin despite the ceasefire announcement. But Syrian Kurds fleeing Turkish offensive are hopeful about ceasefire. I'm very happy about the ceasefire. I hope all citizens will return to the country. I too will return once security is established in Syria. I am very happy about the ceasefire. I hope all citizens return to the country. I too will return once security is established in Syria. The ceasefire announcement also brings relief to US President Donald Trump, who faced criticism at home over removing US troops from northern Syria, clearing the way for Turkey's offensive. The U.S. House of Representatives had voted overwhelmingly on Wednesday to condemn the decision. The vote was 354 to 60 for the resolution, as dozens of Trump's fellow Republicans joined the majority Democrats in favor. Trump was accused of abandoning Kurdish-led SDF forces that were till now U.S.'s ally in Syria to fight the Islamic State terror group. However, after the ceasefire announcement, Trump said the Islamic State group was totally under control. The U.S. also announced that it won't impose further sanctions on Turkey following the ceasefire announcement. But I want to thank President Erdogan of Turkey. I want to thank the Kurds and Kurd leadership. I want to thank certain other countries that behind the scenes were helping us out. 
and it's a tremendous thing. Uh, ISIS is totally under control, and we're continuing to capture more. The agreement on cessation of hostilities is a welcome relief for civilians, dozens of whom have been killed in the operation so far, and at least 1,60,000 have fled the area. There were indications that the offensive was only going to get more violent as the Syrian army entered the cities of Manbij of Aleppo province and Tabqa of Raqqa province to counter Turkey's military progress. So it is a relief, but Turkey says the offensive would only be permanently halted when the SDF had left the border zone. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Disastrous start to Hong Kong's new legislative season. On Thursday, Hong Kong's top leader Carrie Lam was prevented from carrying out a question and answer session on her policies for the coming year. Several pro-democracy lawmakers were ejected from the proceedings for unruly conduct and the session eventually broke up in disarray. Earlier on Wednesday as well, Carrie Lam was unable to give her annual policy address in the chamber and was instead forced to flee under a torrent of abuse. It was another disastrous day in Hong Kong's new legislative season. On Thursday, pro-democracy lawmakers heckled leader Carrie Lam inside parliament and called for her to step down. The legislative session was repeatedly suspended. Several pro-democracy lawmakers were ejected for unruly conduct. The session eventually broke up in disarray. Earlier on Wednesday too, there was chaos in Hong Kong's Legislative Dear Council. Carrie Lam was formed in verbal abuse from the opening of the session. She was unable to give her annual policy address and was instead forced to deliver the speech two hours later by video link. Interestingly, her policy address entitled Treasure Hong Kong, Our Home, focused on four aspects of work, namely housing, land supply, improving people's livelihood and economic development. It's interesting that her, where her priority is at with housing as opposed to all this that's going on right now in Hong Kong. Um, she's in a difficult position, obviously, but it is, you know, her own making. So. It's difficult for her to get out of it, but ignoring the real issues is not the solution, I don't think. Yeah. While there was disorder in Parliament, on the same day there was blood on the street. Hong Kong's civil human rights front leader was attacked with hammers and knives. It was the second such attack on Jimmy Sham, head of the civil human rights front, since protests escalated in the city in mid-June. And this is not a single incident. since. July this year, more than seven legislators, district council candidates have been under vicious attack and get hurt. And none of these cases have we got a suspect arrested. Meanwhile, in another key development, U.S. lawmakers supported Hong Kong protesters by passing a bill aimed at upholding human rights in the city. The bill, which still needs to pass the upper house, the Senate, would mandate an annual review to see whether Hong Kong had sufficient autonomy from the rest of China to justify its special trading status. For years, the people of Hong Kong have faced a barrage of unjust and harsh restrictions on their freedoms. If America does not speak out for human rights in China because of commercial interest, then we lose all moral authority to speak out for human rights any place in the world. Meanwhile, Hong Kong is braced for another weekend of unrest with a march called for Sunday to the West Kowloon Rail Terminus. The facility is seen as a symbol of Beijing's presence in Hong Kong because it connects travellers to the mainland Chinese high-speed rail network 
and because mainland Chinese customs and immigration laws apply in parts of the complex to the dismay of many Hong Kongers. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. In World Panorama, we'll take a very short break and after the break, we take a look at violent clashes between demonstrators and the police in Catalonia. So why are the people of Spanish territory of Catalonia so angry? Well, all the details on the other side of the break. Stay tuned. Spain's region of Catalonia has seen a week of protests this week. The demonstrations uh, were triggered by Spain's Supreme Court's decision on Monday to sentence nine politicians uh, between 9 to 13 years in prison for their participation in uh, the 2017 Catalonia referendum. There were clashes between security forces and separatist protesters which turned violent as well. At least 11 people have been arrested in connection with the riots. Now, Spain's caretaker Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez has blamed the protests on organized violent groups. Spain's semi autonomous region of Catalonia is on the boil again. The entire week saw road blockades and street clashes between police and demonstrators. The protests have been triggered by the lengthy prison sentences handed to pro-independence politicians this week. The tensions came after the Spanish Supreme Court on Monday handed down prison sentences of between 9 and 13 years to nine Catalan independence leaders for their part in a failed attempt to split from Spain in 2017. After the ruling, hundreds of people marched to Barcelona's El Prat airport as well as blocking roads and train tracks across the region. 108 flights were cancelled, tourists stranded. Close to 100 people have been injured in week-long protests. The ruling is terribly unfair. It's a ruling that contradicts basic rights. The right to protest and gather. The right to free speech and parliamentary immunity. The former head of Catalonia's regional government, Carles Puigdemont, at a protest rally in Brussels said that the sentences showed a strategy of repression and revenge. While Puigdemont is subjected to an European arrest warrant issued by the same court, he was not part of this trial because he fled to Belgium, where he now lives in self-imposed exile. No propaganda strategy in the world could mask so much shameful injustice. The great decision of the Spanish justice system marks the down of a new era in which exercising fundamental rights and freedoms will be restricted to all citizens. Spain's caretaker Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez said that the sentences must be carried out and blamed the protests on organized violent groups. Nobody is above the law. In a democracy like Spain's, nobody is subject to trial for his or her ideas or politics, but rather for criminal conduct as provided by the law. In 2017, Spain descended into its worst political crisis when separatist leaders attempted to push forward with the Catalonia secession. Police and protesters clashed in the streets as a referendum ruled illegal by Spain's constitutional court went ahead and was followed by a declaration of independence in October that year. The Spanish government then dismissed the entire Catalan executive and parliament, later holding new regional elections, which again resulted in pro-independence parties winning the majority of seats. Bureau Report, Rajasabha TV. And here is a look at some more international news stories in Global Buzz. People were seen queuing outside a petrol station in Ecuador's capital Quito on Tuesday after President Lenin Moreno officially scrapped his own law to cut expensive fuel subsidies. 
The president's move came after days of violent protests against the IMF-backed measure, returning fuel prices to prior levels until a new measure can be found. The signing of the decree represents a win for the country's indigenous communities who led the protests, bringing chaos to the capital and crippling the oil sector. Heavy fighting broke out in the northern Mexico after the security forces seized one of the sons of a jailed drug kingpin, Joaquin Al Chapo Guzman. Fighting raged for several hours after a video Guzman Lopez was found during a routine patrol in the city. Footage showed heavily armed men firing on the police with cars, bodies and burning barricades strewn in the road. Police withdrew without Guzman in their custody to avoid further violence. French luxury brand Christine Dior apologized on Thursday and said that it supported China's territorial sovereignty after it was criticized for using a map of China that excluded Taiwan in the presentation. Dior, which is a part of a luxury group LVM, had said in a post that it had started to seriously investigate the incident. Taiwan is China's most sensitive territorial issue and it considers the self-ruled island a wayward province and part of a one China. Rescue workers in Japan search for the missing as the death toll from one of the worst typhoons to hit the country rose to 77. Many drowned after flooding of scores of a river bursting their banks. More than 346 people were in injured after the typhoon lashed through the Japanese archipelago at the weekend. Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe on Thursday visited the evacuation centers in Fukushima and Miyagi, two areas severely damaged from flooding caused by Typhoon Agibis. And the International Monetary Fund on Tuesday lowered its global growth forecast for 2019 to 3% in the newly released World Economic Outlook report down 0.2 percentage points from its uh, estimation in July. Noting that this is the slowest pace since the global financial crisis, IMF Chief Economist Geeta Gopinath said during a press conference at the Global Leaders' Headquarters that the growth continues to be weakened by rising trade barriers and growing geopolitical tensions. After Amazon fires, a mysterious oil spill has marked fresh environmental crisis for Brazil. The oil spill since early September has polluted shores across a vast area of Brazil's northeast. Now, Brazil says that the crude is of Venezuelan origin. The crude oil has set off concern about wildlife. Biologists have treated several turtles that have washed ashore covered in crude, but some have died as well. A turtle coated in oil, washed up on Alcantara Beach in northern Brazil. Dozens of dead turtles have been washed ashore over Brazil's northeast coast after an oil spill was reported off the country's coast. The spill is polluting some of the postcard beaches in one of the nation's top touristic destinations and affecting wildlife. However, the source of oil spill has not been yet identified. Brazilian officials say the oil is not of Brazilian origin. President Bolsonaro says the spill was done intentionally with a criminal intent. It's a volume that is not constant. If it were from a ship that had sunk, we would still be receiving oil. It seems this was done criminally. Brazil says crude probably leaked from a ship in the ocean and that it has characteristics similar to Venezuelan heavy crude. However, Venezuela's state oil company categorically denied having anything to do with the slick. On the other hand, the possibilities of underground oil leakage or tank washing in ships are considered remote. Brazil's Navy and Federal Police are investigating this spill. 
Meanwhile, the thick and vicious oil debris has contaminated 139 locations spread over 2,000 kilometers across nine Brazilian states since early September. To date, more than 135 tons have been collected from the Brazilian coast, which is equivalent of over 500 barrels of oil. The state of Sergipe has declared an emergency and asked residents not to use the beaches and not to come in contact with the oil. This is the largest extended environmental accident recorded in the country. The coastal ecosystem of northeastern Brazil is very fragile, with mangroves, rocky coves and coral reefs. Environmental impact analysis already indicates that food chain organisms have been contaminated with the transfer of the substances to larger marine animals. Biologists fear that it will also affect whale breeding. The oil also reached the coast of the state of Bahia in regions considered a sea turtle nursery, where the Thamar project acts to preserve endangered marine species. As a result, environmentalists here suspended the release of more than 600 baby turtles at sea because of the risk of contamination. Bureau Report, Rajasabha TV.